Allen Lund Company, 47 years young and a proud sponsor, wishes OOIDA all the best as you celebrate 50 years. OOIDA, representing America's truckers since 1973, presents Landline Now with your host, Mark Reddick. A proposed rule to require automatic emergency braking systems in trucks has stirred quite a bit of controversy. But what are truckers saying about it? I'll talk with Landline Magazine senior editor Mark Schremer. Girls in Wisconsin recently got a chance to explore the world of trucking. Landline Now's Ashley Blackford spoke with the trucking company who was one of the partners of the event that taught young women about the industry, safety, and the options for them in the trucking world. And finally, the race has begun to replace Representative Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the U.S. House. And while it may all sound like Beltway Insider talk, the fact is the lack of a Speaker has real consequences, including for truckers. I'll get a rundown on what's happening and why it matters from Bryce Mungin of OOIDA's Washington, D.C. office. But first, the news with Scott Thompson. Thanks, Mark. Our top story today... Thousands of UAW-backed workers at Mack Trucks walked off the job this Monday morning. Last week, it seemed as though a strike would be averted after Mack and the United Auto Workers came to terms on a new agreement that called for wage increases, signing bonuses, and better benefits. But Sunday, in a vote, 73 percent of UAW members at Mack said the agreed-upon terms didn't go far enough and rejected the proposed contract. The strike includes 3,900 workers at plants in Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Florida. This is the first UAW strike at MAC since 2019. That one lasted for 12 days. Meanwhile, the separate UAW strike at the big three automakers carries on, but it won't be getting any bigger, for now at least. This after a concession from General Motors. The automaker agreeing to bring electric vehicle battery plants into the UAW's national contract, a move that means they will likely be unionized. Union President Sean Fain said the concession came after a threat to strike at a plant in Arlington, Texas, that makes highly profitable SUVs. So, for now at least, the UAW strike will stay contained to some 25,000 workers at 43 GM, Ford, and Stellantis facilities. Fain said negotiations are making progress. He said the auto companies are now offering raise increases between 20 and 23 percent over the course of a four-year contract. As a refresher, the United Auto Workers Union is asking for wage increases that are about double that, plus a number of benefit improvements. The number of people employed in trucking rebounded last month. The Bureau of Labor Statistics says nearly 9,000 trucking jobs were added to the economy in September. That's the largest increase since May of 2022 when more than 12,000 jobs were added. It represents a turnaround from August when more than 25,000 trucking jobs were lost and July when the decrease was nearly 7,000 jobs. David Spencer, vice president of market intelligence and Arrive Logistics, told Landline that although there was job growth in September, it may not be a sign of good things to come. Spencer said trucking conditions remain challenging, adding he expects things to get worse before they get better. He also noted that large quantities of drivers entered the market when there was money to be made in the spot market and that balance must be restored before conditions can improve. Year-to-date, trucking jobs are down by nearly 23,000. Last year, they went up by nearly 61,000. As for the entire U.S. economy in September, 336,000 jobs were added and the unemployment rate remained unchanged at 3.8 percent. Estes Express Lines now says most of its systems are back up and running following a cyber attack early last week. In a statement, Estes says it never stopped moving freight, all the while acknowledging that operations were affected. The first hint something was wrong coming last Monday in a social media post. The less than truckload carrier saying at the time they were experiencing an outage in their core IT infrastructure, which was impacting a number of systems. Further details have not been released, but the company says it's on its way to being fully operational. A new recall alert now in effect for more than 250 Kenworth and Peterbilt trucks. Packard says the problem is with the trailer brake release. The timing may be delayed, which can create instability of the trailer and increase the risk of a crash. A select number of trucks are impacted. They include certain 2021 through 2024 Kenworth T280 and T380 trucks, certain Peterbilt 548 and 536 trucks, model years 2020 through 2024, model year 2024 Peterbilt 537s, and model year 2020 through 2024 Kenworth T480 
80 trucks. Dealers will replace the fittings and hoses in the affected valves free of charge. Owner notification letters are set to go out near the end of November. If you have a question or concern in the meantime, contact the Kenworth or Peterbilt customer service lines. The trial against two organizers of Canada's Freedom Convoy protest is set to start back up this Wednesday. Chris Barber and Tamara Leach are facing charges of mischief and counseling others to commit offenses such as mischief and intimidation, all in connection to the protests that overwhelmed downtown Ottawa for about three weeks in early 2022. The protests centered on COVID-19 mandates. The trial of Barber and Leach began last month and was expected to last 16 days, but has already exceeded that. Tragedy in south-central Oklahoma last week when a dump truck driver trainee was killed after getting caught in the crossfire of a police shootout. Authorities say it started with a Cleveland County Sheriff's deputy trying to stop a car along I-35. The driver took off starting a chase that ended when the deputy conducted a tactical vehicle maneuver. The suspect and deputy exchanged fire. One of those bullets hit the deputy in the chin. Another struck Guan Frierson, who was in the passenger seat of a dump truck. He was killed. An investigation will determine who fired the shot that did kill him. The deputy is expected to make a full recovery. The driver of the dump truck wasn't hurt. The suspect fled and is still on the run. A Pennsylvania-based trucking company is off the hook in a disability discrimination lawsuit. Smith Transport was sued by former employee Craig Smith, who said the company did not accommodate his allergy to cigarette smoke, which caused him to have severe migraines and blurred vision. Smith said he was forced to drive in company trucks for extended periods of time while co-workers smoked cigarettes inside the vehicle. And while he complained to management and also filed a complaint with the Pennsylvania Department of Health, Smith said the pleas fell on deaf ears. He quit and moved, then later filed a lawsuit. But according to the court opinion, reasonable accommodations were in fact made by Smith Transport. The court granted Smith Transport its motion for summary judgment, essentially closing the case. Local officials in West Virginia are calling on the state to install a runaway truck ramp following a recent crash that could have ended much worse. It happened last week on Route 33 in Pendleton County. Officials telling 5 News that a semi was traveling east when it lost its brakes, plowed through a construction zone, hit two pieces of construction equipment, and narrowly missed a line of vehicles stopped at a stoplight. The emergency services coordinator for Pendleton County told the local news station that the incident was very close to being a mass casualty event. The truck driver was taken to the hospital, but there's been no update on his condition. There are no runaway truck ramps in the area of the crash. Officials say they hope to meet with West Virginia Governor Jim Justice soon to talk about adding some of those, along with other safety features. And finally, Travel Centers of America has snatched up a New Mexico travel center. TA says it's acquired Russell's Truck and Travel Center, which is located off Interstate 40 in Glen Rio. This is according to the Quay County Sun. It recently spoke with the director of operations for Russell's, who told the paper that the family-owned travel center will keep its name for the next three years. The free classic car and memorabilia museum located on site will stay open for at least five years, with donations going to local food banks. This new deal follows another a few months back when TA bought the Russell's location in Springer, New Mexico. That's Landline Now News for today. I'm Scott Thompson. Thanks, Scott. November 6th through the 12th are the dates this year for the Truckers for Troops campaign. All that week, if you join OOIDA or a New Year membership, 10% of that money will go into a fund to send care packages to U.S. troops overseas and to help homeless veterans through the Veterans Community Project. And OOIDA will match that money dollar for dollar. Next, I'll get the latest on automatic emergency braking from Landline Magazine's Mark Schremer. Ashley Blackford reports on a Girl Scout trip to a trucking company. And we'll hear from Bryce Mungin of OOIDA's Washington, D.C. office. We'll be back in a moment. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now. Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. Control your toll costs and eliminate tolling headaches with prepass tolls. Prepass tolls means toll volume discounts. Just one invoice for all tolls and fewer violations. Call 877-878-5970 or go to prepass.com.
Attention all truckers, Dean Michael, the tax doctor here. I want to talk to you about those dreaded tax problems. I know you want to keep on trucking and not even think about them, but let's face it, they're not going away all on their own. You need professional help. I've been helping truckers put their tax problems in the rearview mirror for years. I can help you too. Call me now for a free consultation at 888-557-4020 or go to mytaxhelpmd.com. It's like I always say, keep your eyes on the road, I'll keep mine on the IRS. 888-557-4020. It's tested and proven. Burn 2.1% less fuel when you balance all wheel ends with Centromatic. Call 800-523-8473 to get the OOIDA discount. Landline Now. Welcome back. Two federal agencies have proposed requiring automatic emergency braking systems in large trucks. Senior editor Mark Schremer covered the topic in the most recent issue of Landline magazine, and he's on the line with me now to discuss the topic. Well, first of all, tell us the story of Carrie Moore. It involves this technology and her experience with it. Walk us through, if you will, what happened to her. Yeah, um, so... So I guess I'll kind of start from the beginning with with Carrie. Um, you know, um, when this uh, rulemaking came out, there was uh, um, you know about more than a thousand comments that came through, and I was uh, reading a lot of them that came from truck drivers, and we were hearing kind of over and over uh, from drivers about false activations and different issues that drivers were having with the technology. They're basically saying this technology isn't ready. But I came across truck driver Carrie Moore, as you mentioned, and hers really kind of kind of stood out to me. And she was talking about, I think it was in like the winter of, of 2022, she was driving in Michigan um, around midnight, roads icy, um, and she's going around a curve, a gentle curve, and she's in a truck with an AEB system, and the system apparently picked up on the guardrail thinking that she was going to run into it while it was just going around a curve. And so it apparently, according to Carrie, did a uh, full activation on the brakes. And uh, as you'd imagine, on ice, on on that type of situation, it it just kind of skid, started to lose control, thought she was going to go into a median and luckily, there were no other uh, vehicles around at the time, um, and she was able to regain control. But as you can imagine, it really, you know, shook her. And uh, like I said, that at, from reading her comments, I, I did a, you know, I tracked her down and, and did a phone interview with her. And uh, it was even difficult to, to talk to her about it because, uh, you know, more than a year or so later, um, you know, she was really... Uh, shook by the incident and and will not get in a vehicle with that technology anymore. Um, she she just won't. Well, and that's going to get harder and harder, of course, as more vehicles have the technology. Yeah, I mean, and what she's basically said is that, um, um, like I said, she had such a, a bad experience um, with it that um, you know she is making sure she's with the company that will not. Uh, put her in a truck with that tech, um, you know, and, you know, things can always change, but at least the way uh, she looks at now with, with the way the technology is working and, and some of the bugs uh, that she's seeing and other drivers seeing, she's basically saying that she will leave the industry before uh, she's put it in a truck uh, with that technology uh, the way it is right now. I mean, um, you know, and, you know, like I said, her, her story was one of the ones that was maybe the most impactful because you can kind of visualize uh, that scene and, and, you know, how kind of scary it was uh, for her. But um, if you look through the comments that were filed from truck drivers, uh, the idea of that happening with like a, with, uh, you know, a guardrail on a curve uh, is apparently very common. Um, going under like an overpass with the shadows, apparently that is very common. Uh, for the system to pick up, uh, uh, you know, think that they're going to run into something based off of a shadow and it's hitting the brakes. Um, so you get a lot of drivers, especially ones that have been out there for 10, 15, 20 years, have a safe driving record, and they just don't feel comfortable with this technology. They don't, you know, and who wants that? I mean, who wants to just, you know, suddenly lose control, especially when you are kind of, a, you know, an expert driver, a professional, you've been doing it. Uh, for decades, um, you, you've been doing it safely, and now 
uh, there's something out there, a technology that will kind of take the control out of your hand. So a lot of them feel uh, uncomfortable with it. And, and uh, like I said, I can understand. And, and uh, technology uh, doesn't seem to know, you know, w- when it's icy and, and when the conditions are, you know, are really dangerous for that sort of thing. Well, let's take a step back a little bit here, Mark, and talk about the actual proposal. This is from the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration and the Federal Motor Carrier Safety Administration. What exactly have they put on the table? Well, so right now we have, um, a, a, you know, a, a notice of proposed rulemaking that had come out. They are planning on issuing uh, a final rule um, in April. Um, but what we basically, uh, you know, have is that this joint proposal would require, you know, AEB systems and electronic stability control systems on new vehicles that weigh more than uh, 10,000 pounds. Um, so it's basically all, you know, in all, uh, class seven and eight vehicles, um, I think it would be, uh, would have to meet these AEB standards, uh, three years after the rule takes effect. Um, and, you know, there's, and for the different weights, there's, there's different kind of classifications for each one of them. Um, this is not, it would not require, you know, to retrofit, uh, the tech, but basically, uh, say this actually, um, you know, say we see a final rule here in April, um, and then, you know, I'm assuming probably at least 30 to 60 days of a comment period, uh, there, um, it, you know, if, if that, you know, goes into, goes into effect, um, you know, we're, we're talking several years out after that, but gradually, um, you know, if this were to, to go through and any attempts to, to block it, uh, are stopped, uh, you know, you're going to see, uh, more and more of these trucks, uh, eventually, you know, be mandated to have these technology in the coming years. Now, at the same time this is happening, the National Highway Traffic Safety Administration is investigating some of the problems like uh, Carrie Moore described with AEB or automatic emergency braking. I'm wondering if you can describe what aspects of the situation the agency is specifically looking into. Yeah, so on this um, report that came out earlier this year, um, they – are looking into the false automatic braking, that same thing that we've just been kind of talking about on certain Freightliner and Western Star trucks. And apparently there were about 18 uh, complaints that they've received into false AEB activation with, you know, basically it's, it's hard braking and there's not an actual roadway obstacle, similar to what we've just been talking about, whether it's the shadows on the bridge or, you know, whether it's the guardrails, uh, those type of things that, that it's been picking up on. And, and that's what's really kind of interesting about this, that uh, the announcement of that investigation, I think, came out within weeks before uh, they announced this joint proposal from uh, from NHTSA and FMCSA. So the, the timing is just very peculiar um, that you would be all in on a mandate because, you know, I've talked to drivers, uh, especially younger drivers, who actually are more than fine with uh, AEB technology being on their trucks and, and, and that type of thing. I, I have talked to a few I like that, but this is calling for for a mandate. This isn't calling uh, for everybody to make their own business decisions and and decide whether or not that they think it's safe or whether their drivers feel comfortable with it. This is this is going to be a requirement for all. And when you have these type of questions and these type of problems that we're hearing over and over uh, from drivers that these things are happening, it just seems uh, they're getting a little bit ahead of themselves uh, for a requirement. Um, you mentioned the notice of proposed rulemaking. OOIDA has written comments to that. Uh, it said in part that this is not ready for prime time, much on the lines of what you've described already. Can you go a little bit deeper into their comments? You know, this is what they're they're hearing from truck drivers. Um, you know, these shortcomings, um, you know, need to be addressed before you go ahead and – uh, move forward with with a mandate, um, and the other part of this. Now, in fairness to to the to the agencies here, and it's an FMCSA. We should probably back up a little bit and say, you know, this was uh, included. Or, you know, Congress had in there in the 2021 infrastructure law uh, for them to move forward on this, but also OIDA in their comments does point out 
that part of the things that Congress asked for was also to, you know, reach out um, to the trucking industry and, and that type of thing and, and get more comments to figure out, okay, if this, if this sort of thing was ready. And they really um, kind of have failed to do some of those steps and kind of um, just uh, kind of hit the button down. We're just going to move forward as, as fast as we, as we can uh, to get this, this implemented and get this through. Um, I mean, when you look at it, you know, this, uh, comment period just uh, ended recently on this notice, and for them to be having a final rule April 2024, Mark, you know as well as I do how slow government moves at times. For them to be targeting that big of a turnaround from a notice that had more than a thousand comments, that's that's pretty fast, uh, you know, for government speed. You mentioned more than a thousand comments there, and of course, uh, we've talked about Carrie Moore and what she had to say. But uh, there's a lot of other truckers that did comment. and in, in your coverage in Landline Magazine, you cited some specific examples. Can you share a few of those with us? Yeah, um, so, you know, so like I said, a lot of them, you know, Carrie's uh, example was the one that was the most vivid. Um, that really, like I said, you can kind of kind of put you there. But a lot of the drivers were saying, um, you know, a lot of the similar things, and it's really just kind of, uh, you know, over and over. And I, and I know it's a harp on the same things, but the technology isn't ready. Um, you know, that it's it's doing these false braking issues when I'm going, you know, ramps and overpasses. Um, here in, you know, uh, Joshua Campbell, a truck driver, I'm kind of looking through this, talking about how it just slams on the brakes. And, uh, you know, how dangerous it is on winter roads and that you need to be thinking about all of these things, um, you know, different uh, uh, whether you're, you know, in a place with an area with a lot of hills and, and that type of thing. There's just a lot of issues with it. And to just to put this flat mandate mandate down when um, you have um, all of these complaints, you got an active investigation from NHTSA. Um, you know, that we're still waiting to hear uh, what that says. But, you know, all these drivers are just saying, hey, this is dangerous. I don't feel comfortable with this. And, um, you know, you shouldn't be moving forward with a mandate. And, you know, some of them uh, even talked about uh, the similarities. If you look back, um, you know, in the 1970s, uh, you know, NHTSA, uh, you know, began a regulatory process uh, to mandate anti-lock brakes. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, now, you know, everybody, uh, you know, analog brakes are, are, are a common thing on, on all vehicles and, and that type of thing. But at the time that it was in the 1970s, uh, when they first went forward with a mandate, there were a lot of problems. And, um, you know, this the story that I have in the October issue of Landline uh, magazine kind of details a little bit of some of the things that came out in the New York Times in the 1970s. And they had to roll things back, um, you know, in, until in, until the technology was actually ready. And, and so, um, you know, I'm, several drivers that have been around for decades kind of mentioned um, that as well. And they feel like this is something, uh, you know, that they're just, same type of deal. Like, okay, we got a technology that's great in theory. You know, I talked to, when I said talking to Carrie Moore, she goes, if it worked perfectly, she'd love to have it on her truck. And and that's the way I think most of the people have. But what we're having is we, we know the problems exist and we, we have this idea, oh, wouldn't this be great if it worked? But we're kind of, you know, right now they seem to be ignoring the fact that it doesn't work perfectly. Uh, when they get there, that I think, uh, you know, every driver would, would love to have that, uh, you know, backup uh, to protect them and to protect others. Okay. Well, Mark, thank you very much for all the information. All right. Thanks a lot. That was Landline Magazine senior editor Mark Schremer talking about his coverage of automatic emergency braking in the most recent issue of the magazine. You can read his coverage at the website landline.media. Landline Now will be back in a moment. Firestone tires are for more of everything. More miles for every tire dollar and more confidence in your fleet. At Firestone, we help fleet save with dependable value. Find your local Firestone dealer today at firestonetire.com dealer. Ready to make more money? 
Use a better load board. For a limited time, get 50% off Truck Stop Load Board Pro. Just go to truckstop.com slash go and enter promo code READY2023 when you purchase Load Board Pro. When it's time to overhaul your truck engine, help protect it by insisting on a genuine Vibratec TVD crankshaft damper. Heavy duty, absolute premium quality, and they're made right here in the USA. Find a dealer at VibratecTVD.com. Landline Now, welcome back. Nearly 100 local Girl Scouts explored careers in the trucking industry and STEM today. A recent event in Wisconsin gave a group of Girl Scouts a chance to learn about trucks and what a career in trucking could look like. Kate Whitman is the Marketing and Communications Manager for Paper Transport, one of the partners of the event. She joins me now. Kate, tell me more about the event and what you did. Uh, sure. We had a really great opportunity. Um, Michelin Tires, they, they reached out to us, uh, gosh, probably around May or so, and said, hey, we, were, we really wanted to see if you guys would like to partner up with us to create an event where uh, Girl Scouts could get their patches for like women in trucking. And so that led to this really great big event uh, that we just hosted this Saturday where we invited over 100 girls to come on down and go through about six stations to learn about different aspects of trucking, including anywhere from, you know, the the pre-trip inspections, life on the road, get to get into the inside of a truck, speak with two of our truck drivers, um, as well as uh, one of our former drivers who she has moved into the office. She went into recruitment, and now she's in our extended coordination. And they also got an opportunity to uh, play a couple of different supply chain games um, with Christina Depri, who is our intermodal uh, director. And she created a really fun game where uh, <laughs> they got 12-sided die, and for whatever value that they rolled on the die, um, you might like have a traffic jam or whatever, and the idea is that you had to get freight from one point A to point B, and you need to get it to it on time. And so, really, to kind of get around with the idea of like the different planning and all those logistics within um, transportation. Um, so it's much more than just you know saying, hey, you know, your only career path really here is uh, being a truck driver. There's so many roles that play into it. Uh, and then we also had, uh, to make it something a little bit more relatable to them, we had a Girl Scout cookie supply chain relay where they had to, you know, everywhere from the ingredients to the production and manufacturing to the, even what their role is in the, co- the cookie supply chain, we call it, and really kind of having a better understanding of what it takes to, you know, get those cookies to consumers. And then we also had another station that was just showcasing, you know, the different roles within women in trucking. And of course, if not the biggest hit of the event, um, it might have been at least the second runner up, that would have been the truck simulator Mm. where we partnered with women in trucking, which is an organized that really focuses on developing career paths and encouraging women to enter into this field and providing different resources and support. And uh, they have a trailer they call Whitney. And there are a number of monitors in there where uh, the, cat, the girls or anybody that's going in there can learn more about the stories of women in trucking, how they got into trucking. Some of them were just, you know, really kind of emotional. They were just really kind of tied it, uh, or pulled at your heartstrings. Um, and then, of course, they also got into the truck simulator. And my goodness, let me tell you, you get into that simulator, you have three big monitors big one in front of you and two on the side that are basically um, simulating your your mirrors on the truck and the truck actually shakes it when you when you go to you know start or um, you you go on the gravelly kind of path and like the seat actually shakes around it was really fun for the girls to be able to to do that and really kind of soup to not be able to get the whole uh, experience and get to learn more about trucking oh and I almost forgot um, Michelin tires they had a one of their engineers come in and she was able to give us an example of like the different tires that are designed to go with the different needs of trucks and like uh, and what they're hauling and all that. So um, that was another real favorite event at the Trucks Are for Girls event. Wow. I'm curious. I've I've done the the Whitney, the simulator in that. And um, yes, I my calling is not to be a truck driver. I'm curious, how did the girls do at that? 
you know, I think it's similar to what would be the range for all um, anybody that enters into trekking. There, there are some folks that maybe they, they didn't make it the full minute, and then there were some folks that, you know, they could go for hours and they would be just fine <laughs> driving along on it. So I think they did really well. They did really well. That's awesome. Where, um, you mentioned you they reached out to you about this idea to do this event. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Um, how many girls were there? Do you know? Um, we estimated about 86 girls that had come in or that checked in with us during registration. And then there was um, somewhere around probably 40, between 40 and 50 adults. Oh, wow. What were the reactions um, from the girls as they went through the, the different stations? I, I got to tell you, every time I heard somebody, you know, say like, I want to be a truck driver, that really kind of warmed my heart. Overall, the, I, the reception was really great. Whenever I would, uh, you know, be, encounter some of the girls, I would ask them, like, what's your favorite event so far? And like I said, it was a tie between the truck simulator and Betsy Barron's. Betsy Barron's, uh, she was the dr- truck driver that I alluded to where she drove for a, a shy of 20 years. Uh, and then she and became a driver recruiter and is now working over in our extended operations. She took them through basically a pre-trip inspection, uh, showcasing like what a fifth wheel is, um, walking all along the trailer and all that. They just really loved Betsy and the stories that she told and just her enthusiasm. That's so awesome. Why is it so important to have events like this? I think that the real, the real bottom line is that we need women to feel encouraged to come into fields like like engineering in the trucking and all that. I think that that's something that a lot of, you know, even to this day, a lot of people think that that's not for me. I think the industry is still, especially in truck driving itself, that role uh, is very, very male dominated. And really being able to showcase that it is a viable option for women um, and that provides a diversity of thought. Uh, divert, you know, improvement as far as needs and all of that that we are able to then improve upon um, within within transportation in general. Uh, I think that it's also on, on the other side of it. It's also really great for some of our drivers who have daughters that they want to include them and in, you know, kind of almost mount take your take your daughter to work day kind of thing. I think that there's so many different elements and benefits that come out of an event like this, one, just the hands-on learning that the girls get and that they can then apply into their life or, you know, just have that level of inspiration and knowledge. And then all the way to just, you know, really just understanding transportation. Where do where do all the items that they get underneath the Christmas tree, where do they come from, really? <laughs> I mean, obviously, I don't want to spoil Santa Claus at this moment, <laughs> but um, really, like, it, it, they come from truck drivers. They come off truck. And I think it's just really important just to, within the balance of all of it, for just with the education and elements of it. Yeah, I was curious about that. I think um, on one of the, the Facebook posts, you know, wasn't just showing them that, you know, this career is possible for them, but like the safety aspect of it as well, I, I thought was interesting that that was also taught. Is that right? Absolutely. Everything from um, one of the things that we really wanted to make sure is that in the, the, truck, in the truck demo uh, area is we wanted to be able to provide them with some similar aspects of what applies in the trucking field also applies to their parents' vehicles. And so, in particular, tire pressure. (laughs) Uh, A lot of people, you know, especially this time of year, um, I'm not sure where you're located, but for us, uh, we're headquartered in Green Bay, Wisconsin. And this time of year, your tire pressure, it fluctuates um, just based off of the temperature outside and all that. And a lot of people don't pay attention well enough to their tire pressure. And underinflated tires can be disastrous on the road for not only your safety, but for the for the drivers that are around you. And so we we showed them how they can detect uh, whether tire pressure need, is is low, and you know d- different methods that they that they're able to take with that, and really what it means to be a, a safe driver in that space. Um, also within you know just the truck simulator. You have to watch your blind spots. You have to watch, be careful for 
and aware of everything that is around you. Um, otherwise, it's really difficult for you to, to become a safe driver and to be able to enter, enter on the road. And so I think that really opened up their eyes a lot to more than, you know, it is much more than, you know, in cars these days, it's just a push of a button as opposed to, you know, turning the key. But it, it is so much more than just, you know, getting in the vehicle and going. You, you really do need to be aware of your surroundings and, and be safe. How old were the girls? Oh, they they ranged everywhere from um, I think pre K to I think uh, the oldest was a freshman in high school. Oh wow! So they're very wide range. Um, I believe from Daisy to senior. And I'm curious. This was obviously probably very beneficial to the girls. How is this beneficial to paper transport? Well, I think it really brought a sense of pride for a lot of our team members who were participating into the event. Um, one, just uh, a lot of the women that were, <laughs> that, that worked over uh, in Green Bay, just seeing that trail, like if you saw the Whitney trailer, it's, it's just really awesome mm. to have this big, basically billboard on the side of a trail, uh, that it's, it's a strong woman and having that representation. I just, I think there was a lot of sense of pride, uh, that we were providing this. Uh, I think it also, um, really helps to just letting the community know that we were here and that we we are a community-based employer and we're trying to provide more support and activities that support the community. And that might be anywhere from education-based programs to um, activities at various events within the community. Uh, we also do a number of charity-based programs uh, right now we're we're doing one that's um, that's based on assisting people with, who need uh, money and lodging detergent and whatnot at laundromats in the local area. And so we have a fundraiser that's going on with that right now. But like I said, it, for paper transport, it's it's really about community and you know really providing that support within the community. And what do you hope all the girls took away from the event? I hope that they took away that trekking's pretty cool. <laughs> that there are a lot of different opportunities in this world. And as much as I, I think that there could be a possibility and a sheer chance that uh, they all become YouTube stars, I'm, <laughs> I'm not terribly optimistic. Uh, but that transportation, supply chain, it is a viable option and it's something that ha- is a really diverse field. And I think that anybody can really find something that they love within it. All right. Yeah, I think I like what you said, you know, just to show them that it's not just driving the truck, but how there's so many other facets to the industry. You mentioned that was something that was kind of taught through at this event. Is, is that right? Right. You know, from all the women that we had at the event, we all participated in in some facet of the supply chain, whether it was uh, from Michelin tires and the tire engineer to obviously salespeople, marketing people, uh, planners. Um, we had our director of intermodal. Uh, she facilitates all the, the train partnership and maneuvers. So I, I think that, and then of course our, our drivers, I think that there's just so much more to trucking than, than people really when they, when they just, think of trucking. They think just the truck. And there's so much more to the people behind this industry. Do you think the girls enjoyed the event? Uh, so the girls, um, they really were excited at the end of the event. Um, they got a STEM badge based off of their their learning level. Uh, and they also got their I Love Trucking patches. And they, they were all pretty excited to put them on their vest. Fox 11 News covered the event and spoke with Angela Latito of Michelin, one of the partners who put on the event. This event's so great for young girls because, you know, when you're growing up, you don't always see uh, other women in these roles. And it's a great opportunity for them to see other women doing something that they don't always think a woman can do. And it really opens their mind growing up to all the things that they can be. For Landline Now, I'm Ashley Blackford. Stay tuned for more after this. Since you started, what you've loved about trucking is the freedom. Heading out on your favorite route, a good driving song, and thinking about truck insurance. Well, maybe not that last one. 
That's why we're here. At OOIDA, we have a full range of truck insurance products, expert advice, and great customer service, helping you get the right coverage for your operation. Go to OOIDA.com because your job is to drive. Our job is to help with everything else. Landline Now, welcome back. The race has begun to replace Representative Kevin McCarthy as Speaker of the House. And while it may all sound like Beltway insider talk, the fact is the lack of a speaker has real consequences, including for truckers. Here with a rundown of what's happening and why it matters is Bryce Mungin of OOIDA's Washington, D.C. office. Bryce, how are you doing? I'm good, Mark. How about yourself? Very well. Um, I wonder if we can kind of start by reviewing the situation and what happened up until now that brought us to this point. Yeah, so last week, uh, kind of a, f- a few different issues came to a head in the House of Representatives. And really what happened was a uh, group of Republicans um, moved to uh, <laughs> declare that the uh, um, declare that the speaker's chair be vacant, basically. So uh, voted to remove uh, Speaker Kevin McCarthy from his position. And that was possible because of uh, the tight margins that Republicans had in the House, basically with a very small majority. It doesn't take a whole lot of discontent from within your conference to uh, move to remove the speaker. So now that that's happened, we have all these questions swirling around about what happens next. So last week, Basically, after the speaker was removed, uh, the House moved to a recess, and they've been talking since then about what their next steps might be. So where are we exactly in terms of their process for finding a new speaker? I mean, have have they uh, gotten ready to vote? Are they meeting? Are they discussing? Yeah, it's, it's kind of all those things, and there's really not a lot of hard and firm answers. What we saw in the immediate aftermath of the speaker being removed was uh, members moving behind the scenes to try and position themselves to be the next speaker. So you have a lot of internal conversations, a lot of member to member conversations uh, about uh, who's going to be the next speaker. We saw a few names uh, pop up and some surprising, some not as surprising, but um, uh, Congressman Steve Scalise from Louisiana, um, who is currently uh, behind um, or was behind Speaker McCarthy in the leadership order, has uh, floated his name is in, and is seen as one of the top contenders for the position. But also Congressman Jim Jordan from Ohio, uh, influential member who uh, previously led the Freedom Caucus, has also announced that he's interested in the speakership. Uh, so right now they're trying to coalesce their support. The plan as it stands right now is their members are planning to have some internal conversations today on Monday. Uh, tomorrow on Tuesday, they're supposed to have a candidate form and then Wednesday, they could start voting, but really, uh, until any member is confident that they will have a majority of the votes on the House floor, uh, I I don't think we'll go and see them vote on the House floor. So uh, we'll see, but this may drag on for a little while here. Uh, The Washington Post reported that McCarthy himself said he would return to speaker if asked. Uh, How likely is that? I mean, I think that is a pretty outside, uh, um, you know, pretty unlikely to happen, uh, especially because I don't see any indication that those members who voted to remove him from office are going to change their votes. And absent those members changing their mind or absent uh, Democrats announcing that they want to support uh, Kevin McCarthy for speaker, I don't see how he would be able to pick those votes up. But I, I will say uh, you know, I don't want to rule anything out uh, over the past few years here. Uh, I think a lot of the times uh, when you can kind of dismiss something or it's seen as really unlikely, then it does happen. Uh, you know, it should uh, at least teach us well enough to to not completely dismiss anything. So let's talk a little bit about the effects of this. What is the practical effect, broadly speaking, of yeah. having the speaker's chair vacant? I mean, can't they just have someone up there with the gavel and keep going? Yeah, yeah, no, and that's a really great question. And as, as far as we're concerned, this is what we're really interested. Aside from all the the politics of it, is uh, how does the house operate from here? And uh, a lot of it 
you know, it, it's so it is unprecedented. It's an unprecedented decision for the House to remove the speaker. And so uh, really, um, it, it's not like you described where the uh, temporary replacement right now can just go ahead and conduct the business as speaker. Um, the rules, uh, at least as members are interpreting them right now, don't allow him to do that. So um, the House has to come come to a decision on how they want to proceed. And we haven't seen anything that they've done so. So really, the 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 cleanest way to do this is to elect a new speaker. But in the absence of that, the longer this draws on, um, it, it, there's going to be a lot of uncomfortable and difficult questions that come up. Uh, the House is going to decide, you know, will we consider any legislation? Will we consider any funding bills? So a lot of this is going to play out day by day, I think. So there's a lot of uh, things going on in the House of interest to truck drivers. Uh, some bills we are waiting to see introduced, some bills that have already been introduced that we're hoping to get passed. Uh, let's talk about the ones that have already been introduced that are that are in the House. Does this hold them up and, and what is being held up? Yeah. And so the, most notably, we've been pressing for a vote uh, on the House floor for the truck parking legislation. That legislation was reported out of the House T&I committee earlier this year, uh, and we've been asking that they, the full House takes it up. So while this speakership question is resolved, it's unlikely, I would say nearly impossible that a bill like that would be brought up. Um, and the, the challenge is the longer this goes on, the less time there is to consider a bill like that. Because the other issues that need to be resolved are you know, keeping the government funded and keeping the government open. The uh, Congress and the president avoided a shutdown, but now they are still facing another funding deadline in about 40 days. So that's the most pressing issue they're going to face. So, you know, uh, the first thing they have to do is, you know, figure out who's going to be the next speaker. How are these appropriations bills going to be handled? Uh, and then only after that, are they even going to move on with some of the business that they'd like to consider? Uh, and in a, some of the other issues we are watching are in those funding bills. Certainly the uh, appropriations bill for the, um, you know, for DOT is something we're watching. Um, recently, we've seen some funding come through on 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 parking projects. Uh, uh, you know, there's also a, in the um, in the transportation funding bill, there's a prohibition on moving forward with a speed limiter mandate. That's obviously something we'd like to see signed into law. So uh, as long as these other questions about the speakership are out there, Congress's tension and their time are going to be taken up with that. Once they do elect a speaker, I mean, what does it matter who holds that chair? Is there a real difference in terms of legislation we would see depending on whether it's uh, Congressman Scalise, Congressman Jordan, or someone we haven't heard of yet? Yeah, you know, I, I think the answer is yes. And I think you see that play out in how different uh, factions or different parts of the Republican Party are considering who they want to be speaker. Uh, I think you have members who are described as more centrist or more moderate. They view Congressman Jordan more skeptically because he came into the House uh, as a more conservative member uh, using, uh, you know, tactics that pressured leadership. Uh, the Freedom Caucus previously forced out uh, uh, another speaker, John Boehner, uh, a number of years back. So I, I think more moderate members are wary that um, uh, Jordan's speakership might be more difficult to navigate. On the flip side, you have members who are more conservative, who uh, view someone like Congressman Scalise as already part of the leadership structure, as uh, potentially closer to former Speaker McCarthy. So they're more skeptical of him. And again, given that any member is going to need to get about 218 votes, it's, it's difficult right now to see how that's going to happen quickly. Uh, we just have a few seconds left. What happens if this remains vacant for an extended period of time? Yeah, you know, they're going to have to figure something out. And in a lot of ways, it's uh, it's difficult to say. But in, in some other ways, if a majority of the House decides they want to move on something, more or less they can do it. So if they want to empower the temporary speaker uh, to do something, it seems like they could be able to do that. So sooner or later, they're going to need to do it. They're going to need to come to some sort of agreement. Okay. Well, Bryce, we've run out of time, but thank you very much for the information. Yes, thank you. I've been talking with Bryce Mungin of OOIDA's Washington, D.C. office. And folks, call your members of Congress about the important issues in trucking. The number is 202-224-3121. Thanks for joining us. I'm Mark Reddick, and this is Landline Now.
Thanks for listening. Be sure to like and subscribe. If you want more content, go to landline.media to get updated news, information, and archived editions of our show. Once again, that's landline.media. I'm a dad. A son. A husband. Wife. I'm a writer. Photographer. I farm. I'm a veteran. I love old cars. Fishing. My kids. Chrome. And I am. I am. I am a professional truck driver. And And together, together, we are OOIDA. OOIDA was founded by truckers to stand up and speak on behalf of truckers. We've done that by combining the individual voices of our members into a single, powerful voice. Protecting your interests, defending your rights. Join us. Make your voice heard. Join OOIDA, the owner-operator independent drivers association. Call 1-800-444-5791 or visit OOIDA.com.